Tassan. Hello, hi, hello, Palm Springs. All right. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Michael. It's really a pleasure to be here with you uh, briefly uh, from New York. Uh, so today I wanted to talk to you about uh, a shifting landscape in architecture. And that, that landscape, that shifting, is really creating a kind of revolution in architecture, and it's a media revolution. And I'm, I'm kind of, if I may, I think I'm the right guy to talk about this because I sit at the intersection of two companies that I run. I run Holwich Kushner, which is a 40-person architecture firm in New York. And then I also am the CEO of a venture-backed startup called Architizer, which is the largest database for architecture online. And what we do is we connect architects with building product manufacturers. So sitting there at the intersection of technology and architecture, in my office actually, the technologists watch the architects do their work, draw, they're like, a, they're like our guinea pigs and we get to create stuff for them. Um, I'm, I'm seeing these trends shift and this media revolution happen and affect my industry, our industry. What does a media revolution look like? It looks like this, that's me. Uh, as a Care Bear or something. I don't know if you guys know what this is. This is Masquerade. Anyone use Masquerade? Your children. All right, good. That's, that's good. That's better than the last group I spoke to. Uh, Masquerade is a little startup from Belarus, uh, Europe. A uh, couple guys started it. Three months after it launched last year, they were getting 500,000 downloads a day. So in three months, they had 12 and a half million users. Not long after that, uh, Facebook made an offer to buy them. They did buy them. We don't know for how much, but at the same time that they bought Masquerade, they made an offer on Snapchat for $3 billion. So you can guess it was pretty substantive. Snapchat, by the way, just IPO'd for $25 billion. Yeah. So this is, this is just my way of saying, this isn't just my theory. This is actually happening. Media and the way that we communicate with each other is fundamentally changing, and the people that bet on things like this and that build communications companies are completely aware of that. So how is this going to affect architecture? So to tell you that, we have to look at where we've come from. And to do that, I'm going to give you a very brief 30-year history of architecture communication. Thrilling. Don't all get too excited. Uh, but I'm gonna do it in like 10 minutes, so it'll be amazing. So let's go back in time. Let's go back in time to New Jersey. Uh, I was nine years old, 30 years ago. I grew up in New Jersey, and this was my childhood bedroom. This is all relevant and will become clear momentarily. Uh, this bedroom, uh, lovely bedroom, lovely home, amazing family. The thing was is that the bathroom that I used to use was a walk away, and between the bedroom and the bathroom was a balcony that overlooked the family room. So every time I went to the bathroom, everyone would see me. Every time I took a shower and came back in a towel, everyone would see me. And at the time, I looked like this, which uh, you know is cute now. It was so awkward. I was so awkward. And I hated that walk. I hated everyone looking at me. I hated that balcony. I hated that house. And that's architecture, right? The visceral, emotional connections that we make to the places where we spend our time, that's really what architecture is about. I know we have to deal with zoning and math and budgets and maintenance, but ultimately, when the tire hits the road, when the rubber hits the road, that's what architecture does. How does it do that? So on average, Americans spend 90% of their time indoors. That's amazing. That means that architecture is impacting people in ways that we don't even understand. That makes all of us a little bit gullible and very, very predictable. Right? It means that when I show you a building like this, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking democracy and stability and government. And I know that you're thinking that because it's based on a building that was built 2,500 years ago by the Greeks. This is a trick. This is a visual trigger that architects use to get a predictable emotional response from our audience. And we've been using this trick for a really long time. 300 years ago, we used it to build banks in Philly. We use it to build art museums in Berlin. In America in the 20th century, we use it to build houses. And look at these little guys keeping the ocean away, super strong. This is really useful, right? Because I don't have to tell everyone in this room, building things is hard and expensive. And it takes a long time. So the people who pay for new buildings, 
governments, institutions, developers, you're naturally going to be risk adverse. Who wants to try something new when you've got so much on the line? Wouldn't you rather just do the thing that was done before and you know works? That's how we end up with buildings like this. This is a, uh, this is a nice building. It's a fine building. If the architect of this building is in this room, sorry. Uh, you see it's got a dome. And it's got this round thing on it and columns and red brick. So the thing about this building is that it was built in 2004 in my hometown of Livingston, New Jersey. It's a library. And uh, you can guess what Livingston was trying to do with this. They probably told their architect, make us look like we've been around. Make us look like we are a sophisticated, high property value kind of town, right? Nothing wrong with that. The thing is, the thing is, it's got nothing to do with what a library does. Same year, same country, other side of the country, this library was built. Whoa, this is the Seattle Public Library. So what this building is about is about how we use media in a new digital age. How can a library become a new kind of public amenity for the city? New gathering places, a kind of living, living room or den for the entire city. So how is this possible, right? How is it possible that same country, same type of building, same year, these two buildings look so completely different, two libraries? The answer is that architecture, in my opinion, works on the principle of a pendulum. On the one side is innovation. And architects are constantly pushing for innovation. We're pushing and we're pushing. We're looking for new technologies and new typologies and new solutions for the way that we live today. So we push and we push and we push until we completely alienate the public. Uh, we, get, we get very depressed. We wear all black, as I am right now, uh, because we have no choice, right? We have to go to that other side and re-engage those symbols that we know work. So we go to the other side. Everyone's happy. We feel like sellouts. We have to go back to the other side and start experimenting again. And back and forth we go for the last 300 years and certainly for the last 30 years. OK, 30 year architecture history. <laughs> you thought we'd started. Um, 30 years ago, brutalism. 19, ugh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, concrete, heavy buildings. Architects love it, kind of no one else does. So after the 70s, going into the 80s, the architects push the pendulum into the other direction, right? We re-engage those symbols that we know everyone loves, but we update them this time for the 80s with neon and pastels and new materials. We take traditional forms and we turn those into skyscrapers. We take skyscrapers and turn those into medieval castles. Forms are bold and big and colorful. Frankly, things are getting a little crazy. Dwarves grow into columns. We've got swans on buildings. But context here, it's the 80s. And we're all hanging out in the suburbs. And we're all going to malls. And out there, <laughs> I only have like two minutes to do 30 years. Uh, out there in the suburbs, we can all build our own architectural fantasies, right? And those fantasies can be Mediterranean. They can be French. Or they can be Italian. This is an Olive Garden. Uh, this is the thing about symbols. They're cheap. They're easy. Because we're not building places. We're building memories of places. Because I know you all know this. This isn't Tuscany. This is Ohio. So by the time we get to the late 80s, by the time we get to the early 90s, computer auto automated design is coming up. Architects start experimenting again. We come up with something called deconstructivism. This is like really academic and heady stuff. Forms crashing into forms. Pretty much no one likes it. Ordinarily, the pendulum would just shift back into the other direction. And then something amazing happens in 1997. This building opens. This is the Guggenheim Bilbao by Frank Gehry. And this building, this building fundamentally changes the way that the public consumes architecture. When it was built, Paul Goldberger, the famous architecture critic, said, Bilbao was one of those rare moments when critics, academics, and the general public we're all completely united around the building. Tourism in Bilbao increased 2,500%. The New York Times called the building a miracle when it was built. So all of a sudden, everybody wanted one of these buildings. You have one in LA, in Seattle, in Chicago, in New York, in Cleveland, in Springfield. <laughs> Gary's everywhere. Gary is our very first star architect. So, how did this happen, right? 
These are, cra these are crazy buildings. How did this building become so ubiquitous throughout the world? The answer, I think, is, is that the media galvanized around these forms. They taught us, they told us that these forms mean culture and tourism. And every mayor in the world understood that if I have these forms, I have culture and tourism. That phenomenon happened to a couple of other stark attacks at the turn of the new millennium. It happened to the recently uh, deceased Zaha Hadid. It happened to Daniel Liebeskind. It happened to a bunch of other uh, architects. What's interesting is that as media starts to speed up, that phenomenon starts to happen to the entire profession of architecture. Because think about how you consume a building, right? Do we have it? Uh-oh. OK. Well, that last slide would have told you that we used to consume architecture by walking to the town uh, you know, across the way, taking a horse, taking a boat, taking a plane, becoming a tourist. Then media starts to speed up. You can read about a building in the newspaper. You can see it on TV. Until now, we're all architectural photographers. And we're all constantly sharing images of buildings and telling each other what to think about those buildings. That's amazing. That means that we can make instantaneous emotional connections to buildings that we've never even experienced before. That means that the speed of media has finally caught up to the speed of architecture. Because it, it, architecture actually moves pretty fast, right? It doesn't take long to think about a building. It takes a really long time to build a building, maybe three or four years in the types of buildings that you build. In that time, your architect is still drawing other buildings, two, three, five, 12 other buildings, until they know if the building that they designed five years ago was a success or not. Do you guys see any slides? Uh, that's crazy, right? That means that architects don't have fresh information. That's because architecture's never had a good feedback loop before. That's how we end up with movements like brutalism. Brutalism wasn't a three or four year movement. It was a 20 year movement. Like it's embarrassing to think about. For 20 years, architects were building buildings that nobody liked. That's never gonna happen anymore. Because as you apply media to that pendulum, it starts swinging faster and faster until it's at both sides simultaneously. And we can make those instantaneous emotional connections to forms that we've never seen before. So now I need some pictures. Do you guys need a hand? OK. You want to talk about something else in the meantime? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'm, maybe I'll, I'll skip to the end. I can do this without pictures. Um, you got it? It's worth seeing. Ah, thank you. Well, I'll finish telling you about the theory. I'm going to skip to the end. Oh, here we go. Here we go. That's the feedback loop that doesn't exist. Uh, that's brutalism, which we gave you a lot of in the 60s and 70s. Sorry. Uh, and this is that pendulum speeding up and speeding up and speeding up and speeding up until it's on both sides simultaneously. Let me show you a real life example that my firm built. So we were hired to replace this building that burnt down. This was on Fire Island in the Pines, a town called the Pines, vacation community in New York. We designed this building, audacious forms, forms no one had seen before in the community. So we were scared, and our clients were scared, and the community, uh, which is largely uh, shirtless gay men, which is actually true, uh, they, were, they were scared as well. Uh, so um, we did what's kind of obvious now, but this was five years ago. We put photorealistic renderings online, and we let people talk about it, like it, or hate it. It didn't matter, as long as they did something and interacted with that building so that when the renderings looked exactly like the finished product, there were no surprises. We weren't crowdsourcing information. We weren't crowdsourcing our design. We just wanted them to get to know it. And then that first summer when tourists started showing up and sharing that building on social media, the building ceased to be an edifice and became a part of that community. Because every one of these pictures, look at that happy guy telling all of his friends how excited he is about this building. Each one of these pictures is short-circuiting our collective memory. That means we don't need the Greeks anymore to tell us what to think about architecture. We can tell each other what to think about architecture. This, this was my big theory. 
And I'll show you why I'm right. Because, ironically, Frank Gehry, uh, working here with Mark Zuckerberg on the Facebook campus uh, in San Francisco. This building opened a year ago. And when it opened up, Facebook didn't send out a big uh, glossy press release and give an exclusive to the New York Times, as would have been traditional. They invited 50 Instagrammers to come to the building, and this would be the very first look of the building. These pictures. This is how the world met Frank Gehry's latest masterpiece. This is crazy. The second comment, hey, Mark, did you take this photo, and may we have permission to feature it and credit you? That's Time Magazine asking that guy if he can use their, his picture. Media has completely turned on its head. The discourse around architecture has shifted. If you see, aw, oh, dude, you rock, that's how we talk about architecture now. That's super exciting about pursuing innovative forms and getting people to respond to it. This new connection really changes everything. It means that architects aren't these scary creatures. Uh, we still wear all black, but people aren't terrified of what we're doing anymore. And the public has an appetite for innovation. They want unique places. They want innovative forms. So when we think about architecture at my firm, this is kind of what we want to avoid. This is Mies van der Rohe, who is an excellent architect, but thoroughly terrifying looking, I'd say. Our official portrait is this. We want it to be friendly. We want to be open. We want people to like what we do. We want people to love our buildings. Taking the lessons that we've learned from this emotional connection, I'm going to show you one project, this uh, project for University of Pennsylvania called the Pennovation Center. It's an innovation center for the University of Pennsylvania. You get it. OK. So uh, Penn, West Philly, they bought a big brownfield campus down uh, across the Schuylkill, old DuPont paint factories. This is what the, the first building looked like. Pure potential, they told us. So the plan is put all of their graduate students who are working in robotics into this building and let them incubate new businesses and put the University of Pennsylvania back on the innovation map. OK. What we do, how we work, is we sit down with all the stakeholders. We work through ideas, generate forms, uh, get criticism, talk it through. And ultimately, we end up with a design that looks like this. Everyone coalesces around it. What was this design? We start with that very simple, super efficient 1950s factory building. Hyper, hyper efficient. Great. That's perfect for all the lab space. The thing about entrepreneurship and innovation is that you can't stay in the lab. You got to get out. You got to evangelize. You got to raise money. You got to get your friends using your product. So we knew that we needed to add critical spaces like the boardroom, the bleacher to pitch your ideas, the bar, the restaurant. Those we designed to come out of the building and sculpt it into what becomes the visual communication device of the building, this spiky front facade. And ultimately, this is the building that got built. Uh, and it opened uh, just a few months ago in Philly. And you can see that the building, we kept it rough. We didn't want it to be so precious that these innovators couldn't feel like they could manipulate the building and make a mess. It's all about these public spaces surrounded by this efficient ring of laboratories. I don't think you can see it in plan, but maybe you can see it. There's a lot of straight lines and then some empty space in the middle where there's a public big stair that brings you up to a central corridor that's for flex space, working, hanging out, and ultimately ends in that big pitch bleacher. We used, <laughs> we worked with our MEP guys who wanted to kill us because it was the exact opposite thing that architects ask MEP guys to do usually. We were just like, give us the biggest ducks you can give us. Give us everything oversized. We don't want to hide anything. We wanted to celebrate the industrial nature of this building. Big fluorescent lights, but composed in a unique way to make something special out of this space. And here you can see looking down to the pitch bleacher. Here it is in action. And of course, ultimately, what gets us so excited is these amazing views composed by architects, then taken and communicated out to the world on social media. And seeing these pictures, these are all off of Instagram, of people using the space, engaging with the space in ways we didn't even think about. This is what gets us excited about architecture. And you can see pictures like this where it could kind of be everywhere and anywhere are contrasted with pictures that really tell the story of the building. 
Here it is during the recent snowstorm in the east. These guys giving the peace sign from the prow. And then like this, this picture I love, Penn Robotics, the icon of the building behind them. This is what the University of Pennsylvania is about. And this is the message that the building will continue to give out for years to come. This is the opportunity. This is the revolution that we're sitting on here. We get, I think, I think we're all on the same page. We want bigger budgets, and we want to build better buildings. And finally, social media has given us the capital with which to get that money that we can trade for. We're not just building spaces. We're building love. We're building communication around those spaces. And we should be fighting for better buildings, greener buildings, smarter buildings that we've always known how to build. We've just been waiting for the public to want it to. And that's really it. The stakes are incredibly high. Because we're not just building buildings that reflect our society. We're building buildings that shape our society. From the laboratories where they make robots, to the schools where we send our children, and the walk that they take from the bedroom to the bathroom. Thanks, everybody.